he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are free from your sickness. And he laid his hand on her and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, there are six, six days in which work should be done, so come join them and get healed. And not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrite, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And the woman, a daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan had bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bound on the Sabbath day? And he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious, glorious things being done by him. Luke 13, 10 through 17. Thank you. You may be seated. In June of 1942, a scandal erupted in the United States when a newspaper published its story about the Battle of Midway. It was during World War II, and the United States naval battle with Japan out in the ocean near the island of Midway would end up being a turning point in the war against Japan. But what sent shockwaves through the military was the Chicago Tribune's front page story that recounted the details of the battle. The Chicago Tribune's story made it clear that the United States military had actually broken the military code that Japan was using to communicate during the war. And the fact that the United States actually had been able to break this code was a, a top secret in the military and in the government. The program that had decrypted the Japanese communications um, was only known by a handful of people. And so you can imagine the military officials' panic when they read top secret government uh, information that was on the front page of the Chicago Tribune. They launched an immediate investigation to figure out what had happened. A, a journalist had accidentally seen some things on a, in a ship communication room that he wasn't supposed to see, and he didn't know that it was top secret and had really published it inadvertently. They ended up dropping the charges against the journalist because they realized that by prosecuting the journalist, there was only more information that was going to come out. But what's really actually... I, you want to say sad or ironic, is that the government of Japan never found out about it. They didn't have any spies in the United States that were reading American newspapers. So even though it made the front page in America, the people who wanted to see it, and maybe you could say from the Japanese perspective needed to see it most, never saw it. With our communication and the interconnectedness of the world today, it's almost impossible for us to imagine a front page story in one country not making it to the, even the most basic facts of it to another country. But that's exactly what happened. And if you think about it, people today have similar ideas when it comes to God. We have this sense that he's out there somewhere. That the truth is out there somewhere that people can know and read, but I just haven't been able to find it yet. I just haven't been able to see it. It's like it's in another language in a faraway country. And perhaps humans could say that if it weren't for the ministry of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Because Jesus comes and displays who He is for all the world to see. 
It's unmistakable. So it's not like the truth is out there somewhere anymore. Now it's here. As we've been together in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has been laying before the crowds the urgency of repentance. He calls them hypocrites for being able to figure out what the weather is going to be like that day, but not being able to see what He is doing in their own day. He's been pushing home to them the fact that there's a limited time to repent. People brought up these horrible tragedies that had happened recently, and they have this kind of self-righteousness of like, well, at least that didn't happen to me. Um, I haven't done anything that bad that God would let that happen to me. And Jesus turns to them and says, what about the tragedy of your own death? What are you going to do when you die one day, even if it's not by a tragic accident? What about your life? Jesus has just said that the axe is already sitting at the roots of the tree that he's given the example of a, a fig tree in a garden that never brings forth any fruit and never has any figs on it. What would happen to that tree? Well, it would get cut down. Uh, the, the, the gardener is going to come along and say, what's this doing here? It's just taking up space. It has to be, it has to be destroyed. And, and he ended that story in verse 9 by the the gardener saying to the owner, if it bears fruit next year, fine, but if not, cut it down. So there's this sense of judgment is coming, but God is being patient. He's not going to be patient forever. You can't just think that because there's no fruit that God's going to overlook it forever. So after this call to repent, after this sermon that Jesus has given to the crowd, now what's going to happen? Is anything going to be different? Now Jesus is back teaching at the the synagogue, the local congregation for Jewish worship. And he's there teaching just like he was back in Luke chapter 4. Remember what happened when Jesus spoke in Luke chapter 4? He reads the scroll of Isaiah and then starts explaining to them what it means. How did that that, uh, Saturday end? They carried Jesus, picked him up, and tried to throw him off a cliff. They wanted to kill him. So that was Luke chapter 4. Now Jesus is back at the synagogue after the crowds and the the whole countryside has seen more miracles. They've heard more sermons. Now is anything going to be different? Jesus is going to put his power on display again for everyone to see. And there's going to be no one that can say, oh, I didn't see it. I didn't know about it. It's going to be unmistakable. His power is going to reveal everyone's response to him. The power of Jesus reveals your response to Jesus. So first notice this morning that the power of Jesus confronts hypocrites. The power of Jesus confronts hypocrites. Some people get to come into the presence of Jesus, but the results aren't good. It actually only reveals a hard-heartedness and a refusal to believe in him. And in front of this crowd, Jesus calls this woman forward who has been bent over double for 18 years. All she can do is walk around staring at the ground, and she's unable to straighten up. And unbelievably, miraculously, something that only the power of Jesus could do, he heals her for everyone to see. And the response of the synagogue official is highlighted here. The synagogue official would have been the one person that was basically in charge of the service each week. They would have been in charge of picking the readings, picking the people to do the prayers. So this was somebody who was a well-respected religious leader, and he was kind of in charge in this moment. And what's his response? He's indignant. He's angry. Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. He began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, but not on the Sabbath day. Have you ever met somebody who has a, uh, an exaggerated sense of their own authority? You know, uh, maybe a, a boss at work, or maybe the, the classic example is uh, one of the security officers like at the mall, Right? They kind of walk around like they have this, you know, they're in charge and they know what to do and they can tell you what to do. But then if you really know anything, you're like, 
no, you, you're not in charge of anything really here, right? Like you can't, you're not, you're not really that important and you don't have that much authority. And that's, this guy basically comes across like a, like a mall cop here. Um, he's angry. Um, he's actually angry. His, his first response after seeing a woman get healed who has been broken by a disease for 18 years is to get angry. And the, the funny thing is, it's almost funny, is that he doesn't have the guts to go to Jesus directly about it. He, he doesn't say, hey, Jesus, this is wrong. You shouldn't be healing people. Um, this guy's answer to uh, the problem, as he sees it here, is to give an announcement. That's another thing you've probably seen people do this before, a situation at work. I can remember it back when I went to college. Um, even sometimes here at church, there'll be one person that's doing something that maybe needs to be corrected or that are not supposed to do it. And, and someone will say, like, you know, well, what we need to do is make a big announcement about this so that this person stops doing this. Or, you know, if it's at your job, they'll send an email, you know, a, a, an oddly specific email, like, to anybody that's been coming in late for their shift on Thursday mornings, please be aware. But you're like, when you see those kind of specific announcements, you're like, we all know who you're talking about, right? The, we, why, why are we making this broad general announcement when we're really, we know exactly what's going on and who you're talking to? And I think this is what this guy sounds like here, right? He says, uh, guys, listen, we're implementing a new policy here. There's actually only going to be healings, you know, Sunday through Friday, not on Saturday anymore. Well, who is the one doing the healing? There's only one person that's doing any healing. It's Jesus, right? And, and it isn't the crowd that really needs to hear this. It's Jesus. But this guy is too cowardly to confront Jesus. So he's angry. He is a coward, and his response to this is basically to tell everyone, hey, Jesus is actually violating the law here. He's violating the law because he's working, in quotations, I guess you can say, on the Sabbath. Now, two things about the Sabbath that you probably already know, but I think it's just worth reminding us of. One thing is, is that keeping the Sabbath was one of the Ten Commandments. This wasn't uh, something that they had totally made up on their own, one of the Ten Commandments was that on Saturday, the Jewish people were supposed to worship God and they were supposed to do no work. And as a result of that, they had started to come up with all of these other complicated rules to make sure there was no possibility that you could even look like you were doing work on, on Saturdays. So they had very uh, convoluted, complex rules of things that you could do and not do that would, were considered work and were not considered work. You could only walk so many miles from your home. Um, you could take your animal and give them something to drink, but you weren't allowed to let the animal carry anything because then the animal would be working on the Sabbath and things like that. So there were very complex rules about what they were supposed to be doing. And the reason that they were really emphasizing this a lot is because they were underneath of the Romans. The, the Roman Empire, as it was expanding, one of the reasons why the Roman Empire expanded like it did was because the Romans would come in, they would invade a country and take it over, and they would let the people keep practicing their religion. That was something that was kind of different about them. All, a lot of other people, when they conquered you, they said, now you have to worship our God and, and do uh, have our religion. And the Romans were kind of smart, and they said, well, look, you can kind of do whatever you want to religiously. You just have to pay taxes, and, and you know, they could take and do whatever else they wanted. So the Jewish people, during this time, it was a point of pride for their people of like, hey, maybe we're conquered by the Romans, but at least we're still going to follow the Sabbath. So that's part of why they were emphasizing the Sabbath and putting so much... Uh, talking about it so much. So this guy basically says, Jesus is breaking these laws about the Sabbath. He's not exactly sure how, but he's just like, you're not supposed to do it. That's it. And of course, Jesus' response is brilliant. Jesus answers him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? So first of all, Jesus doesn't mince words here. Jesus calls the guy a hypocrite calls him a phony, and he shows him that with just a real simple example, everybody agreed that you were allowed to untie your donkey or your ox on, on Saturdays. Nobody was disputing that. Nobody tried to say that animals weren't supposed to drink on Saturday, because then it was, that's bad for your animals. They might die. So everyone understood you could go, you can untie your donkey, untie your ox, and then take it over to the watering trough where it needs to go to drink. 
So Jesus says, if you're allowed to do that on the Sabbath, then why is it wrong for me to untie this woman from this demonic disease that she had? And of course, the guy has no answer. He looks foolish. It doesn't make any sense. So Jesus, at the same point, he's, he, he uses the same illustration to basically drive home two points. One, what Jesus was doing was not breaking the Sabbath by any stretch of the imagination, by even all of the extra, extra laws that they had in those days. Jesus still wasn't breaking the Sabbath by healing this woman on this day. But then the other thing, and he, he goes even deeper into it, it isn't that just a technical point. Jesus' point is, here isn't, well, technically, I'm not doing anything wrong. Jesus says to him, you've missed the entire heart of what the Sabbath is for. He says, and this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? So Jesus pushes in and says, you've missed the entire heart of God. The whole point of celebrating the Sabbath wasn't to celebrate the Sabbath. The whole point of the Sabbath was it was for God. You were supposed to worship him on that day. And what is this God like? He's loving, he's kind, he's holy. He cares about the people who are hurting and the people who are struggling. So this guy completely missed the point of what the Sabbath was for. He completely missed the whole heart of God himself. He actually didn't love God. And because of that, he really didn't love people. He was caught up in his own man-made religion. He had his own ways about how he thought things should go. And that was what he was really upset about. One pastor put it this way. He says, One of the most effective tools that Satan has used to keep people away from a relationship with the living God is dead religion. When our Lord was on this earth, his main battles were not with raw pagans, His main conflicts were with the religious crowd. Down through the centuries, Satan, the master counterfeiter, has has smuggled religious people into churches in order to keep the others from a genuine, heart-transforming experience with God. That's really what Jesus is confronting here, is man-made religion. And you see two symptoms of man-made religion here, right? One is you get angry when your own ideas don't get followed. This guy really wasn't angry because of somebody not following the law of God. He was angry because someone wasn't following how he thought things should go. And we should be upset with ourselves, and we should be grieved when we see people in the world not following things that God has told us to do. But a lot of times our anger is actually really over things not going the way we think they should go. And the other thing is, is that man's religion really always ends up ignoring people or hurting people. People will argue and get upset about things that aren't even in the Bible. And at the end of the day, they don't really care about the people who they're arguing with. They don't care about the people out there who really are hurting. People find time to argue and disagree about all sorts of things, but then they don't actually have time to help people. So Jesus is exposing this man's hypocrisy. He looked like a good religious man, but the power of Jesus confronts him and shows that he's actually just a hypocrite. A Christian, a true follower of Jesus, is someone who knows that the power of Jesus has destroyed your man-made religion. Jesus, at some point in time, if you're a follower of Jesus here this morning, there is a moment in your life that Jesus came into your life and destroyed your own religion. You look back at a time in your life where you thought, I thought I was good, I thought I knew what to do, I thought I, I, I kind of had my own goodness that I could hold on to, and then there was a time that you met Jesus. And his power and his authority, you realized were greater than your power and your authority, and you decided to submit to him. That's somebody who experiences the, the power of Jesus, and, and it reveals a, a, a soft heart a changed heart. But that's not what happened to this man. This synagogue ruler is confronted by Jesus and it reveals hypocrisy. Of course, there's nothing that he can do or say. He's really left the, Luke says, humiliated. This guy decides basically he's going to stop arguing with Jesus because he's going to look foolish. He has nothing left to say. The crowd basically is almost like going nuts. They're like, this is awesome. There's a guy here that's healing people. This is amazing. 
Of course, there's no indication that the people in the crowd ever submitted to Jesus. There's no one in the crowd ever actually repents and bears fruit like Jesus has told them they need to. There's just kind of this general excitement about Jesus. There's this vague interest, like, oh, this kind of sounds good. Oh, this is amazing. Jesus is doing this stuff. And there's people like that still today that are kind of interested in Jesus for a little while. Um, they're, they're vaguely aware of the fact that Jesus is out there and they think I should get to know him better. But it's really only as long as Jesus is entertaining them or Jesus is doing something for them that they hang around. And then Jesus can kind of fade off into the background. And we know that with this crowd, that's basically what happens, right? The, the people in Jesus' day are interested in him for a while. They're fascinated and excited by the miracles. But it doesn't lead them to repentance. So in this account, there's the synagogue ruler who's confronted by Jesus' power. There's the crowd that is kind of generally interested and excited. But then there's one person in this whole synagogue that had gathered to worship God that actually is praising God. There's one woman that's there who is bent over and in need of healing. G. Campbell Morgan said that There is a, if if there's one man or woman in any assembly of human beings more in need than any other, that is the man or woman that Jesus is after. So, in all the people that were there that day, this is the woman that attracts Jesus' attention and attracts his care. Her condition is the definition of helpless. Today, somebody like this, they could go for an, an MRI. CAT scan, you could see what was wrong with their spine, you could diagnose what was happening, there probably would be all sorts of different treatments and therapies that would be available for her, but of course back then they had nothing like this. This woman had been in this condition for 18 years. Luke tells us that she's, she's bent over double. Scholars speculate that she probably had something with her spine where the um, the different um, segments of her spinal cord, for whatever reason, had, had melded together so that it was, because Luke says it was impossible for her to straighten up. It wasn't just like it hurt if she straightened up. It was impossible for her to do that. And there's, there's indications here in the way that Luke lays this out that there was actually more going on with her than just physical, um, than, than just physical things. Luke says there's a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit. She was bent double and could not straighten up at all. So Luke says that this is actually a condition that was caused by a spirit. It's not a case of demonic possession. We've seen other of those in the Gospel of Luke, but that's not the case here. But it's some kind of a demonic influence. And we don't always understand how physical illnesses and demonic power go together. Um, The Bible never gives us some kind of a definitive explanation of how those things work. And then later, at the end of the text here, when Jesus is defending her, he says that this woman had been bound by Satan. So there was something satanic that was also going on with this woman in the exact same time that she had a, a physical thing. Now, we know that if you're a Christian, there, you, are, you are held by Christ. Um, the, the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So we don't have to fear any kind of demonic possession if you are a Christian and you're a follower of him. But we do know that there is some kind of an interaction between the, the spirit world and, and the physical. Remember that Job is allowed to be um, put through that trial, and Satan has a role in that. Now, Satan has to ask permission for every single step of the way. Um, Satan can't do anything that God doesn't let him, but Satan is involved in that somehow. So how all of that works together, we don't know. I'm just pointing out that here in the text, this woman had a physical problem, but then also at the same time, she had some kind of a, a spiritual attack that was a part of this as well. So, after 18 years, this woman encounters the power of Jesus. Jesus saw her, he called her over, and he said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. 
It's actually something interesting. I came across a couple of different commentators made the point that we don't know exactly why, but every time Jesus um, casts out a demon from somebody, he never puts his hands on them. Every time that Jesus casts out a demon in the Gospels, he always speaks to, to them to, to cast out the demon. So that may be kind of why there's almost like a two-step process here of this woman's healing, that first he says, woman, you're freed from your condition, and then he lays his hands on her. And this healing is instantaneous. Of course, even by today's standards, this would be impossible. If somebody was uh, somehow freed from a condition, they would need you know, months of physical therapy and all these other things to go on. But that none of that is necessary here because Jesus just touches her and she's healed. I love what Spurgeon says about this woman. He says, notice one more thing about this woman. She did not get any good through going to the synagogue so long as she merely went there. She went to the synagogue bent double. She came back bent double. If she went all those 18 years, as I dare say she did, she was unable to lift herself up all that long time. Do not, I pray you, you who are regular attenders at the house of God, and yet remain unsaved, get into the notion that all you need is to attend divine service so many times on the Sabbath day or on weeknights, for if you do, you will most likely never get a blessing. This poor woman was not healed until she met with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, and I wish each one of you would come here saying, oh, that I might meet Jesus today. Oh, that Jesus would meet with me. It is a rule with very few exceptions that what a man fishes for he is most likely to catch. If any come here merely out of an idle curiosity, it is possible, though not certain, that their curiosity will be satisfied. If any come to find fault, I have no doubt that you will find plenty to complain of. But if any of you have come determined to find Christ, he will be found. It will be a very surprising thing if you have to go away without discovering him. This is what you really need if you are to be restored from all the ills that sin has wrought. You must come to Christ himself. Spurgeon is saying going to church is not what's going to help you until you've met Jesus first. And in man-made religion, we have this idea, if I can just do these external things, then certainly that will be good enough. And this is a case of somebody who was doing the external things, and it meant nothing until they encountered the power of Jesus Christ personally. This is the difference between dead religion and knowing Christ as your Savior. Dead religion is content with just the outward form. Knowing Christ as your Savior happens when you personally meet Jesus for yourself and experience his power. It's a personal encounter where the power of Jesus meets your helplessness. It's, it's something that happens in your soul because you met Jesus, you believe who he says he is, and your life is never the same. Now, we do believe that one day Jesus is going to heal our physical bodies from everything that's wrong with it if you're a Christian. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you do not have that to look forward to. But Christians believe that one day Jesus is going to return. We are going to get new resurrected bodies. That's what the Word teaches us. But when Jesus was here on earth, the reason that he did these physical healings were largely to point to what he was able to do spiritually. Because our biggest need, the way that Jesus heals us this way today, the biggest area of helplessness that we have is our sin. We have been born bent the wrong direction. We have been born bent away from God. Our thoughts are away from God and towards the earth. Our hearts are automatically turned toward things of this world. And we will spend our whole lives like that unless we meet Jesus. Unless we come to him and he touches us and he makes us whole. He forgives us of our sins. And when he forgives us of our sins, our whole nature is changed. 
Our whole being is healed on the inside. We're still not perfect. We still sin, sure. But we have a new nature. That's the power of Jesus. That's the power that you and I need. In most of these healing accounts, there's something about this person's faith. It's pretty rare that Jesus heals somebody without them asking him to heal them, or there's something about they believe that he could heal them. And this is kind of an interesting case because it's one of the situations in the Bible where there's nothing about her. She doesn't say, ask to be healed or anything like that. But I just want to point out a couple of things to you in the text that do give us, I think, a very interesting picture of this woman's life. One thing is, is that it seems like from the language that Luke uses here, this woman was regularly here. So in other words, like Spurgeon said, it's, she had been attending this synagogue on a regular basis, even with this disability for all these years. So in other words, this woman for at least 18 years, uh, could be more, could be less, had been attending this synagogue and praising God even with this condition. So the other thing that we find out about her that I just, I absolutely love is that Jesus calls her a daughter of Abraham. The only other time that Jesus uses this phrase in the Gospels is when Zacchaeus is converted. Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So this son of Abraham, daughter of Abraham phrase that Jesus uses is not just a simple identifier. It's obviously not racial because they they were in Israel. Everybody was a son or daughter of Abraham that was Jewish. So that clearly isn't what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about spiritually this person is a son or a daughter of Abraham. In other words, this is somebody who has faith like Abraham had, right? This is somebody who believed the promises of God even when you couldn't see them physically like Abraham did. If you know the story of Abraham, right? That's, that's the whole thing about Abraham is that he trusted God even when it was hard. Even when the physical evidence was denying it, he still trusted in God. And that's, that's what made him and set him apart And that's what Jesus is saying about Zacchaeus and Jesus is saying about this woman. He calls her a daughter of Abraham. I love the fact that that's how Jesus describes her. And somebody with a very severe disability, somebody with some kind of major physical deformity, typically becomes known by that disability or that deformity, right? you see somebody and that's the first thing that comes into your mind about them. Like, oh, that person has that problem. You know, if they were in a wheelchair or if they had some other kind of disfigurement, that's instantly what you notice about them first. And before long, as you think of them, that's the first thing that comes to your mind. Um, Maybe if this lady, we don't know her name, but if if her name was like Mary, like a common name, they would say, which Mary? Oh, the one with the, the back problem. You know, and before long, maybe just her name didn't even really get used that much. It's just, oh, that's the woman with the real bad back problem. You know, oh, the woman bent over. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's how every, maybe, probably, how she was mostly known and thought of. But Jesus doesn't refer to her here as the, hey, the woman with the back problem. Jesus refers her to her as the daughter of Abraham. We might see a person and instantly think of their disability or their disease But that's not how Jesus sees people. Jesus looks at someone, and if they are his, if they have saving faith, he looks at them and he sees a son or he sees a daughter. And here's just the last thing that we see about this woman. What does she do when she's healed? He laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. As I mentioned, she's actually the only person in this whole synagogue that it gets recorded as praising God. Why? Because she's healed. Her helplessness met the healer. She experienced the power of Jesus, not just by watching it happen to someone else, not by being offended because Jesus was messing up her man-made religion, But she experienced the power of Jesus because Jesus met 
her and changed her. And that's what I want to ask you this morning. Have you ever met Jesus like that? Have you ever experienced the power of Jesus to forgive your soul? Have you ever experienced meeting Jesus and knowing that he's the one who can make you whole? He's the one that can turn you into a son or a daughter of his. And that's why we praise him. That's where the praise comes from. The praise throughout the week, the praise during our worship services. Why do we glorify God and sing to him? Because we are people who were helpless and now we're healed. Matthew Henry says, when crooked souls are made straight, they will show it by glorifying their God. That's the simple formula for praise. Praise is what happens when our inability meets his power. Where we have a a personal encounter with him and realize that he's the one who can make us whole and only him. I recently uh, saw one of those little kind of cute viral videos that they put out there and the description of the video said that uh, a teacher... Uh, surprised her students with a picture of her favorite student. And there was a box up at the front of the classroom, and the students, they were little cute, you know, first and second graders that would run up to the front, and the teacher had told them, in the box is a picture of my favorite student. And so they took turns going up there and peering inside, and they would smile and laugh and then run back. And so it kind of, you know, for a second, you're like, what, which, who's the favorite student? But then you realize really quickly the teacher had put a mirror in the box, And the Word of God is a mirror. The Word of God exposes you and shows you yourself. And in this story, every single one of us will find ourselves. Some people, and it could even be somebody here this morning, may be here and you are very convinced of your own goodness. You are angry when people don't do things the way you think they should do them. And you are holding on to that goodness that you are convinced that you have. People like that can see the power of Jesus and they still walk away hypocrites. Nothing really has changed. They're just upset that Jesus hasn't gone along in fulfilling what what they think good religion should be? Or do you see yourself in the woman that was healed? Years of lostness and brokenness in your past, but then you met Jesus. Like the song says, I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Do you see the the helplessness in your life that you could have never fixed on your own. The sins that you had done, the times that you had run away from God, and then Jesus met you, and you experienced his power. Do you see yourself as a son or a daughter of God? Is Jesus the the life-changing headline of your life? Because he is good news in the flesh. And once you've seen his power in this passage, you will never be the same. And we each, this morning, walk away from this text, either hypocrites or healed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for each person that's here this morning that no one would walk away from here a hypocrite no one would walk away from here angry at others and convinced of their own goodness and yet even further away from you Lord I pray if there's anybody that's here this morning that has never come to you to be healed of their sin problem 
never come to be rescued, never come to be made whole, that they would do that this morning, that they would see their sin as something against you, the wrong things that they've thought and done, that they would turn and bear fruits in that repentance. Lord, would you make us into a, a congregation of sons and daughters of Abraham, your sons and daughters, of people who are praising you because of what you've done for us, because we've been made whole and been healed by you, that praising you is the, the main part of our life, that we want to glorify you and lift you up because of what you've done for us. So, Lord, I pray that you would make this church a, a place where that happens. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.